John holds a PhD in economic geology uh, and has worked in the resources sector internationally across a range of commodities. He has extensive experience across technical, material, and corporate areas. John has been involved in Greenland since 2008 and the managing director of the Greenland Minerals since 2014. Welcome to the stage. Uh, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. Um, this is obviously a fairly short little presentation, just an opportunity to update quickly on the uh, company's activities and the uh, project status and so forth. So any questions that arise, I uh, look forward to speaking outside in further detail. Slide two, image. <laughs> yeah, I'll stick to the remote control. So just a, a quick summary of um, the company's focus, which has obviously been the Cavanafeld project um, sitting down near the southern tip. So amongst that sort of cluster of activity in terms of geological interest from the gold to the rare metals and so forth. But it's one of the more significant deposits of its kind globally, obviously enriched in rare earths with uh, additional uranium, uh, zinc, um, amongst other things. So there's a, a very deep history to this, obviously 10 years under us, a little bit more now, and then um, a historical phase of investigations as well. But it's primarily, I guess it's significant, it comes to it being a potential large-scale, long-term, low-cost source of rare earths at a time where the outlook is very, very strong for this particular group of metals. So it's a good opportunity in terms of Greenland to consolidate a position of being a major, a major contributor to a, an important material space that's uh, very important for things like clean energy and so forth moving forward. We work closely with the group Shenghe Resources. Shenghe is the most international of China's rare earth companies. They're also working with um, an operation in the United States, so that provides a very good example or template as to how that association works and how that helps to bring a, par uh, a project and product to market. So just moving on, as I've touched on, uh, we're down in the sort of little pocket of southern Greenland. So it's got a number of really important uh, points to it that include existing infrastructure. Um, there's a history of mining in the area. Um, so we've got airports nearby and obviously the mildest part of Greenland climatically. So this is an area that I can see in the future in the coming years being not just important for one or two projects, but actually being a really important hub for a number of projects. And you know, a couple of significant projects come into development and quite quickly that allows other groups to come in and explore at lower cost and it tends to, I guess, continue to fuel discovery, new opportunities and so forth. So I think South Greenland is a really important area moving forward. So the project itself centred on this very unique geological body in Southern Greenland. It's quite well known, the Ilamasa complex. So the project itself has three defined resources, the most significant being Kavanafeld up here. So this has been the focal point of a lot of, obviously, mineral deposit studies, but a huge amount of work from feasibility studies, um, then a lot of environmental work, and then also a lot of work with the community over the last 10 years to really start to look at how we can best develop the project to the, the benefit of local community and the opportunities it can provide. So this just again highlights sort of some of the key points. Over a billion tonne resource under the Australian Jaw Code, um, 100 million tonnes sits at the top of the Cavanafeld deposit that is enough to sustain an initial 37 year mine life. So, that's the component that sort of draws on a lot of detailed um, engineering studies that really define the economics of the project. So most of the project is designed to sit within the geologic footprint um, of the Ilamasa complex, and that really defines what is a lot of the environmental baseline at the same time, which is really important. So a lot of the material handling sticks on the same, let's call it, dispersed geological material um, that is, well, I guess, part of the ore body. So this is just a, a bit of a view, um, looking up the valley, just to provide a bit more of a visual to what this actually looks like. And the deposit itself at Cavanafeld sits behind a lip, so you wouldn't actually see much of the mining for many, many, for, for a number of decades. And then processing facilities are designed to go up the top of the Narsak Valley, around the corner of a saddle. So yet at the same time, would have very little visibility from the town of Narsak. So, Cavanafeld, while it's looked upon as being a significant size rare earth operation, in the scheme of actual mining operations, it's not a particularly big operation. Um, a lot of work's been done processing wise. This kind of ore, it lends itself to simple processing in what's otherwise a very, very complex space. So this is one of the advantages. And in working in Greenland, you really want to look to projects that do have some kind of technical advantage that can help offset some of the logistical, let's say, 
complexities that the Greenland environment can bring, just through the seasonality, through the ice, um, and so forth. And so this basically sees a number of two main steps. One is a simple flotation process. The second, leaching of a small volume of material to produce then a main rare earth product, a zinc product, and a uranium byproduct. So Cabanafil, by its current sort of configuration, will become one of the major producers of neodymium, prosodymium, dysprosium, terbium. And they're the core magnet materials that are utilized in not just the electric car fleet, but a lot of emerging technologies that rely on energy efficiency. So in terms of how this, how this links in, um, Xing Her plays an important role in that they have very large processing capacity and a big market presence. So they become an ideal group to connect you to actual end users globally. So converting what becomes intermediate rare earth products to high purity magnets, which then go into the wind turbines or to an electric cars and so forth. And as indicated, Xing Her also works with Mountain Pass in California. And ultimately that's being designed and set up to be able to cater to downstream let's say, full processing, um, vertically integrated through to high purity end products within North America. Ultimately, Greenland looking at working to do a similar thing uh, for Europe and into European industry, drawing on leading Chinese processing technology. So meanwhile, two big focal points have been, uh, I guess, utilizing a lot of our attention over the last sort of, couple of years. One of them is working through with the various government agencies, the permitting steps, which I'll touch on, um, the other side of it is working on project optimization. As we work towards the development pipeline, you know, we work to bring in a cross-section of groups that are leaders internationally in the space to create a, a team that can work together to effectively deliver the project. And so this is a collective on site, drawing on a, a company, Nuna Logistics, Canadian group, Tetra Tech, major international group, p and engineers, which specialize in Arctic port facilities, and China, C from China, that also specialize in port-related infrastructure. And the metallurgical side draws on Sheng Her resources that are one of the absolute, um, I guess, elite <coughs> groups in terms of rare earth processing globally, and their network of laboratories that they utilize in China, and in particular BTMR Laboratories, <coughs> which has also done the work for Sheng Her on Mountain Pass in uh, California. So it's sort of a, 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 collaborate, a <coughs> collaboration of teams that can effectively work to deliver the project in its best form. On the, uh, the permitting side, obviously this has been a big focal point for us. Um, it sort of goes back many, many years, a lot of the steps um, that led to formalization of the terms of reference and then submission of draft impact assessments. Uh, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of back and forth. We've worked to supplement uh, and, I guess, extend some of the data sets that sit beneath the studies. And on both the EIA, the environmental and the social impact assessment, this brings in expert specialist groups that operate independent from us. That's how they go about, it's how the business, business works. But on each side, we've got a specialist international group and let's say a Danish slash Greenlandic group that brings sort of a local understanding as well. So it's tailored as best as possible, but drawing on international standards to make sure it's benchmarked appropriately. So the, the social impact assessment where that sits, the review process for that is more or less complete. There's a couple of aspects that link into the EIA that are still way standing by. And we're working um, to finalise the environmental impact assessment and hopefully we'll have some updates on that through the coming, coming months. So we maintain a pretty steady dialogue there with the, the relevant parties. And again, um, a lot of the groups that have done the background studies here in terms of independent consultants are very happy with the state of the project and they certainly put their name to it as, as something they stand behind. So overall the project's in, um, let's call it, from the, the feasibility standpoint, very good shape. We've got the, I guess, optimal, let's call it, uh, development partner standing by to help facilitate linking the project into end uses globally through Shenher, and permitting certainly in an advanced state. I think a lot of very, very good work sits behind the project now. So that's, um, that's more or less where we're at. Obviously, there's been a lot of work over the years just on getting regulations in place at a government level. That's something that's extended beyond Greenland over to Denmark as well. Um, so there's a huge foundation which sits behind the Cabanafeld project now. You know, many, many decades of understanding. Um, so it's, it's something that, you know, I think certainly amongst the, the, you know, Southern Greenland community, this is a project that's been simmering away for a long time. There's a very deep understanding of it. And moving forward, we'll certainly be working closely with the community as we look to, you know, make sure we can integrate and provide as, as much opportunity and benefit as the project continues to move towards. 
um, full permitting and ultimately development. So I'll just uh, wrap it up there, but uh, look forward to any uh, any questions outside. And um, yeah, positive event.